<clears throat> Hello, are there any questions? That can go over there. And I've got my thumb drive plugged in here, so <clears throat> can't use this. All right. If there's no questions, let's begin. Sharing my screen now. So today is November 3rd, and we should be on chapter eight, microbial genetics. If you'll note, there is no lab for today. I will be there from 6.30 to 6.45 to answer questions. But once the last question is uh, over <clears throat> or at 6.45, uh, meaning I'll stay until 6.45, but uh, after that, if there's no further questions, I will log off. Please note that the infectious disease paper is due this Saturday at 11.59 p.m., and you should be working on your unknown project. This project will generally take a lot of time, and you'll be uh, requesting several tests, uh, so far, only a few people have been requesting tests, so you should be looking at your results that I sent out, putting the results in the uh, unknown notes page, looking at the uh, chart, making conclusions, and then requesting a test. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, can somebody please confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. I've got a note here saying there's no class on Thursday because of Veterans Day, which is actually on the 11th. But there's no class that we're going to hold next week on Thursday. And... Uh, there will be no class during Thanksgiving also. All right. <clears throat> Any questions about what we're doing? I should probably go uh, just log in in case there's a question. No, nope, that's the wrong place to go, but that'll work. Hmm, that didn't work. All right, so we're on chapter eight. <clears throat> this is the slide that we last talked about, uh, DNA replication being semi-conservative, meaning uh, one strand, well, two strands separate, and then one strand is used as a template for the new strand. And that's uh, the case for both of the strands, meaning the two separate, and each will be used as a template for a new strand. When we say DNA replication is semi-conservative, it means when we look at the old strands of DNA, which are drawn in black here, the new strand is drawn in white, that it's semi-conservative because the replicated DNA will have one strand which is old, as opposed to, and one strand which is new, as opposed to uh, in the daughter cell, one cell would have two that are black and two that are white, meaning two that are new. And that would be the conservative model of DNA replication, which does not happen. We follow the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. And don't ask me what the liberal model of DNA replication is, because I do not know. So when DNA replicates, 
the two strands will separate, which actually I think are right here and here. And uh, the DNA polymerase will use the template strand, meaning the original strand. See, there's an A here, and then put in a T. And then it'll move down, see a C here, and then put in a G. So the new strand is built up on the original template strand. Any question about any of that? You don't really need to know that the DNA nucleotide comes in as a triphosphate. And then when the phosphate bond is broken, which is actually right here, uh, that releases energy, which is the energy needed to bind this T onto that strand, okay? So this gives off the energy which allows this uh, T to bind to that strand. Any question about any of that? So here's a little uh, video. Hopefully I can get this to work. I think it works now from PowerPoint at least on this new computer. And my older computers, when I click the link, it wouldn't open the web page. So that's actually a nice thing with this new computer. Let me get that out of here. Probably have to turn the volume up. DNA is a molecule made up of two strands, twisted around each other in a double helix shape. Each strand is made up of a sequence of four chemical bases represented by the letters A, C, G and T. The two strands are complementary. This means that wherever there's a T in one strand, there will be an A in the opposite strand. And wherever there's a C, there will be a G in the other strand. Each strand has a five prime end and a three prime end. The two strands run in opposite directions. This determines how each strand of DNA is replicated. The first step in DNA replication is to separate the two strands. This unzipping is done by an enzyme called helicase and results in the formation of a replication fork. The separated strands each provide a template for creating a new strand of DNA. An enzyme called primase starts the process. This enzyme makes a small piece of RNA called a primer. This marks the starting point for the construction of the new strand of DNA. An enzyme called DNA polymerase binds to the primer and will make the new strand of DNA. DNA polymerase can only add DNA bases in one direction, from the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end. One of the new strands of DNA, the leading strand, is made continuously the DNA polymerase adding bases one by one in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The other strand, the lagging strand, cannot be made in this continuous way because it runs in the opposite direction. The DNA polymerase can therefore only make this strand in a series of small chunks called Okazaki fragments. Each fragment is started with an RNA primer. DNA polymerase then adds a short row of DNA bases in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The next primer is then added further down the lagging strand. Another Okazaki fragment is then made, and the process is repeated again. Once the new DNA has been made, the enzyme exonuclease removes all the RNA primers from both strands of DNA. Another DNA polymerase enzyme then fills in the gaps that are left behind with DNA. Finally, the enzyme DNA ligase seals up the fragments of DNA in both strands to form a continuous double strand. 
DNA replication is described as semi-conservative because each DNA molecule is made up of one old, conserved strand of DNA and one new one. Okay, any questions about that? I'll leave it in case I want to show you a picture. Oh, fork. Oops, it's running. Uh, so helicase starts the process. This is an enzyme there. Are, are three enzymes you do need to know for the quizzes. Helicase starts the process by separating the double strands of DNA and making them single-stranded. The next important enzyme you need to know is the DNA polymerase. And it's the DNA polymerase which reads the template strand of DNA and then makes the new strand by adding on a complementary basis to what is found on the template strand. And then the third enzyme you need to know is the enzyme that plays a part in the end. Down here someplace. and it's helicase. What it does is it, it links the uh, newly replicated DNA with the older DNA. I'm trying to find where that is. It's not here, it's down further. There it is, DNA, did I say helicase? I meant ligase. Uh, ligase is extremely important on the lagging strand but it is important on the leading strand as well. And that is, suppose we have a uh, strand that had been partially replicated, and then for some reason, like maybe the DNA polymerase falls off, it's not finalized. And then another DNA polymerase starts the process. Well, where that original strand ended, uh, and before the the new strand is put on, which is, these are the two same strands, so they're both new strands. But um, the point is, is that the first DNA polymerase ended, and then the second DNA polymerase began, there will be a gap where the two molecules of DNA will not be linked together. Okay, so ligase seals that gap connecting one DNA nucleotide to the other DNA nucleotide. And it's actually not the nucleotide, it's the uh, uh, sugar phosphate uh, backbone of the, of the DNA molecule that's linked together. That's a uh, covalent bond. That's what ligase does. Now on the leading strand, the ligase may only work twice. And that's at the start where the DNA polymerase began and at the end. And if the DNA polymerase does make um, the entire chromosome, then the DNA ligase would not even work because the start will be the start of the chromosome. There's nothing to ligate the uh, new rep newly replicated DNA uh, to. And then if it runs down the entire chromosome, you end at the end of the chromosome, and the, the ligase wouldn't even work on the uh, leading strand. But usually, DNA polymerase, for whatever reason, doesn't do an entire chromosome, and it will fall off occasionally, and so a second DNA polymerase will begin. And that's why the ligase comes in on the uh, leading strand. Now on the lagging strand, we have many Akazaki fragments. Where do we have that shown here? Ah, 
I'll just go on to my picture down here. On the lagging strand, I guess I don't have a picture of it. Uh, there are many Akazaki fragments and each of them will need to be hooked together to the next door neighbor Akazaki fragment with ligase. So here we have one Akazaki fragment and there's another one being put down and here's, well, here's another one being put this way, I guess. And uh, when this finishes right there, there will be a gap here and that will need to be connected together. And then there will be a gap right here. The DNA will come here and then we'll bind this way, but it won't be linked together and the ligase will put that together too. So the ligase is extremely important on the lagging strand because of the way it's made. Any question about any of that? So is that my next slide? Yes, it is. So DNA is copied in the five to three prime direction. It is initiated at first by an RNA primer. On the leading strand, the DNA is added continuously, meaning the one nucleotide is added after the other. But on the lagging strand, the DNA is synthesized discontinuously in Akazaki fragments. And the reason being is, is that the DNA strand would be running this way, so from right to left, but the DNA is being replicated uh, the other way, this way, which would be from left to right. It's because the DNA has to uh, be replicated in the five to three prime direction, and one of the DNA strands is not running in this direction, and that strand we call the lagging strand. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, uh, that explains how DNA synthesis occurs, DNA replication. Now let's talk about how RNA transcription is made. The synthesis of RNA is made from DNA. DNA is transcribed to make three main types of RNA, messenger RNA, tRNA and rRNA. We have another polymerase doing this. It's RNA polymerase, which binds to the DNA and then transcribes it as RNA. But here's a question for you. How does the RNA polymerase know which messenger R and which, sorry, which RNA to make? How does the RNA polymerase know to make messenger RNA when it should? and tRNA when it should, and rRNA when it should. This is actually a very simple question once you understand genetics and understand it. Well, when does uh, 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 RNA polymerase make RNA, rRNA? Anyone gonna take a guess? Isn't that when it's attached to the ribosome? Uh, no, the <laughs> ribosome is uh, involved in making protein translation. It's not involved in transcription. So the ribosome is not uh, involved here. It is the RNA polymerase, which is doing it and is simply reading the DNA. And that's actually the hint. What is there about the DNA that would tell the RNA polymerase to make messenger RNA, tRNA, or rRNA? Isn't it the nucleotide sequence? Yeah, it's just the nucleotide sequence of the gene. If it is a gene for rRNA, the RNA polymerase will make rRNA. If it is a gene for tRNA, 
the RNA polymerase will make tRNA. If it is a gene that's going to make a protein, which is most of the genes, it will be transcribed as messenger RNA. It's as simple as that. So it depends on what gene is being transcribed for what type of RNA will be transcribed. And then that brings out the next question. DNA replication synthesizes all of the DNA. RNA transcription only occurs where the genes are. Now in a prokaryote cell, at least a bacteria, because there are, <laughs> there are introns in uh, archaea, you don't need to know that, but there are. Uh, bacteria have, uh, not introns, uh, non-coding region, I should say. The bacteria have very few non-coding regions, meaning most of the DNA in the domain bacteria is coding DNA. So most of the DNA codes for a gene. But in eukaryotes, most of the DNA does not code for a gene. Most of the DNA is non-coding DNA. And you could ask the question, what the heck does that non-coding DNA do? And to tell you the truth, geneticists haven't totally figured out the entire answer, but part of the non-coding DNA is involved in the, the uh, what are you calling, the uh, wrapping of the DNA when it's supercoiling to become a, a condensed chromosome, which you see condensed chromosomes only in mitosis and meiosis. So some of the non-coding DNA is involved in, if not all of it, but at least some of it is involved in the wrapping of the DNA to make the chromosome. And then the other parts of the non-coding DNA is just to hold the genes together and maybe space them out so that recombination uh, is more can more easily be done. You don't really need to know about uh, non-coding DNA. I'm just telling you that in eukaryotes, most of the DNA is non-coding DNA, and you probably should know that one. And non-coding DNA is not transcribed. Only the genes are transcribed. Transcription of the DNA begins when the RNA polymerase binds to the DNA. And the RNA polymerase only binds at the promoter, which is a region of DNA right up from the gene. So right before the gene. Transcription then proceeds in the five to three prime direction. That's the same as replication. And RNA is made in the five to three prime direction. And transcription stops when RNA polymerase reaches the terminator. So let me see. I don't think I have, uh, I need to make on this computer. I just got this computer, so I don't have it fully set up. I need to make some links here. So here we've got the DNA. And this would be non-coding DNA. So we're gonna say it's a eukaryote cell. And now we have the gene. We're gonna call it gene one. And then we have the non-coding DNA again. And then we have gene two. The promoter would be this region right here, right upstream of the, uh, let me put that in a different symbol. So that would be the promoter right before gene one. And you'll notice I don't have it immediately before, meaning one nucleotide or even a few nucleotides right before gene one. There is a little region of DNA 
in between the promoter and the gene. Now, right after the gene, and I think it's immediate, but I don't know for a fact where the terminator is. It's a smaller region. I've got it very big. Uh, is the terminator. So let's go on here. So promoter. And then we have the terminator. I might not spell this right. You can correct me if I got the spelling wrong. Promoter right before the gene, terminator right after the gene. And in eukaryotes, we have a promoter and a terminator for each gene. In bacteria, it's a little more complicated and we'll discuss that in a little bit. But for some genes, it follows the same, <laughs> probably for most genes in, in bacteria, it follows the same format, okay? But not always the same in bacteria. But for eukaryote, this is pretty much True. There's a promoter for each gene and a terminator for each gene. The RNA polymerase binds right here at the promoter and then moves down the DNA. And as it moves down the DNA, it transcribes the DNA making the RNA. And which RNA it will make will depend on which gene this is. If it's a gene for tRNA, it will transcribe it as tRNA. If it is a gene for encoding a protein, it will make it a messenger RNA or mRNA. Any question about any of that? Well, hopefully that was clear. Don't want to save that. All right, there we're looking at an actual electron well. Well, I'm not sure this is an electron microscopic image. It's a fluorescent image, but I think it's a, on the electron microscope of uh, RNA uh, polymerase doing transcription. And right there, I think, is the uh, newly uh, transcribed RNA right there. Remember, RNA transcription happens uh, with the flow of information in the cell going from DNA to RNA to protein. And if it goes to protein, it'll be an intermediate uh, messenger RNA. But if it's going to tRNA or rRNA, it's DNA to the RNA. Okay, it doesn't go further. And this is the flow of information within a cell. Any question about any of that? If not, let's look at RNA transcription in a little more detail. It looks like I might have to go to uh, YouTube and do a search. I probably had it on my uh, computer that crashed. Yep. So RNA transcription, meaning I did correct it, but uh, it uh, just looking for one that's short and to the point. I think we'll take this one, which might not be very um, detailed because it's really short. If you're taking anatomy and physiology for the first time, I can guarantee it's not like any course that you've ever taken. And that's why so many students struggle with it. But what if I told you there's a secret study to- Proteins are contained in our DNA. DNA contains genes. A gene is a continuous string of nucleotides containing a region that codes for an RNA molecule. This region begins with a promoter and ends in a terminator. Genes also contain regulatory sequences that can be found near the promoter or at a more distant location. Motor region of the gene functions as a recognition site for RNA polymerase to bind. This is where the majority of gene expression is controlled by either permitting or blocking access to this site by the RNA polymerase.
binding causes the DNA double helix to unwind and open. Then during elongation, the RNA polymerase slides along the template DNA strand. As the complementary bases pair up, the RNA polymerase links nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing RNA molecule. Once the RNA polymerase reaches the terminator portion of the gene, the messenger RNA transcript is complete, and the RNA polymerase, the DNA strand, and the messenger RNA transcript dissociate from each other. The strand of messenger RNA that is made during transcription includes regions called exons that code for a protein and non-coding sections called introns. All right, we're going to skip that point. I'll talk about that later. Such as a five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail are added. This process is called intron splicing and is performed by. Let's move on. Like I said, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, we haven't talked. About joins the adjacent exons to produce a. We haven't talked about that. I want to finish talking about transcription before talking about the cytoplasm um, to begin translation. All right. I think that's it because we don't want to talk about translation yet either. All right. So that was really a little more detailed than I thought in some areas. And uh, um, we will get to all of the topics they, they mentioned. Like I said, this wasn't, it was in some ways uh, a little more detailed than I wanted. Any questions about RNA transcription from this video? All right, let's go through RNA transcription. It starts when the RNA polymerase binds to the DNA. Let's see if I can blow this up. That happens at the, why did that come up? That happens when the uh, RNA polymerase binds to the promoter. So that would be the promoter right there. It's not, uh, mentioned here, but that would be the promoter where the RNA polymerase binds. When the RNA polymerase binds to the DNA, uh, the front portion of it, meaning there's actually a helicase which is bound in here, it separates the two strands of DNA and the uh, DNA becomes single-stranded, allowing for transcription to occur, meaning transcription does not happen to double-stranded DNA. It only happens to single-stranded DNA. Any question about any of that? And you don't really need to know about it because we're not talking about it, but how that happens that becomes single-stranded is a helicase, which is in the complex with the RNA polymerase. Any question about any of that? The RNA polymerase moves down the DNA, and as it moves down, it reads the DNA nucleotide, one after the other, and then adds the corresponding RNA nucleotide to make the newly transcribed RNA. And let me see if I can remember this right. If the DNA is A, it will add RNA of U, uridine, if the DNA is C, it'll add uh, a G. And if it's G, it adds a C. And if the DNA is a T, it will add an A. Any question about any of that? The RNA polymerase will move down the gene transcribing it. Remember, RNA transcription only occurs in the genes. It does not occur in DNA that does not encode a gene or the genes. And that continues until the RNA polymerase reaches the terminator. The terminator is at the end of the gene or after the end of the gene, whatever you want to call it. And the purpose of the terminator is it... Uh, signals to the RNA polymerase to find, fall off. So the RNA polymerase cannot bind to the DNA at the terminator region. 
and so it falls off. When the RNA polymerase falls off the DNA, it will release the, uh, the RNA that's been transcribed. And I guess I never stated it. The purpose of the promoter is it's a region of DNA that codes for the, the RNA polymerase to bind to it. The terminator codes for the RNA polymerase to fall off. Any question about any of that? If not, that's uh, uh, RNA transcription. The RNA, if it is messenger RNA, will then move into the cytoplasm if it's from a eukaryotic cell, because in eukaryotes, RNA transcription happens in the nucleus because that's where the DNA is. Now in bacteria, there is no nucleus so this is all happening in the cytoplasm. But the uh, RNA, if it, it's going to be translated into protein, it'll be uh, messenger RNA, it will then move into the cytoplasm. Any question about that? So in a eukaryote, protein translation happens in the cytoplasm. And of course, in a bacteria, everything is happening in the cytoplasm. So protein translation is the synthesis of proteins by the ribosome. The ribosome uses the information in the messenger RNA. Now, actually, all three types of RNA are involved in protein translation. The messenger RNA brings the information from the gene to the ribosome to be read uh, to make the protein. So it is the messenger RNA that has the code for making the protein. It's actually the ribosomal RNA, which is the, a major portion of the ribosome. Ribosomes are both rRNA, ribosomal RNA, and ribosomal protein. They get together to make the ribosome. And what they do is they, uh, are the sites of protein manufacture, meaning they're the sites where the protein is synth synthesized. And we say that the ribosome reads the messenger RNA, but that's not literally true. The ribosome does move down the messenger RNA and then does read um which amino acid to put on, but it doesn't do the actual reading. The actual reading is done by tRNA, which brings in the correct amino acid for the region of uh, messenger RNA. Is that clear? The point is that in protein translation, all three types of RNA are involved messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and tRNA. And the one that's actually reading the messenger RNA, which has the code, is the tRNA. The ribosome is putting it all together and allowing the tRNA to come down and then moving down the, the uh, messenger RNA so the tRNA can come in. And we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, the messenger RNA is not read one nucleotide at a time. It is read at three nucleotides at a time. And we call these groups of three nucleotides codons in the messenger RNA. When the ribosome attaches to the messenger RNA and then moves down it, it does not begin protein translation when the ribosome first attaches to the messenger RNA. It doesn't begin protein translation until the ribosome moves down the messenger RNA and encounters 
the start codon, which is AUG. So in the messenger RNA, there will be AUG, and that tells the ribosome, begin protein translation here. The start codon is actually uh, doing two things. It's telling the ribosome, begin protein translation here. And it's also telling, I don't know, the ribosome and tRNA, add the first nucleotide, uh, not nucleotide, add the first amino acid, which is uh, methionine, meaning AUG codes for the amino acid methionine. And it also tells the ribosome, begin protein translation here. What happens when the ribosome runs down the messenger RNA and encounters AUG again? Will it start protein translation all over again? Nobody's going to take a guess? Uh, that last part was a yes or no question, so you had a 50% chance of getting it right. Let me see if there's people still here. Yes. Ah, there you go. I don't remember what the question was, so I don't know if you're right or not. The AUG. Uh, the AUG, if the uh, protein is being translated, the AUG does not tell the ribosome to begin protein translation all over again because it's already begun translation. The AUG just tells the ribosome to add the amino acid methionine. Okay. And then the ribosome will go down the codons, one codon after the other, adding. Um, more amino acids until the ribosome reaches one of the stop codons. You don't need to know or memorize the uh, stop codons, but there are three of them. There's UAA, UAG, and UGA. You probably should know the start codon though. AUG is the start codon and there's only one. So I don't feel bad that you have to know that one because there's only one, and it serves a dual function. It tells the ribosome begin protein translation here and insert the first amino acid, which AUG codes for methionine. So do all proteins begin with the amino acid methionine? That's a yes or no question once again. Yes. Uh, yes, actually all proteins, when they're first made, they start with the amino acid methionine. If that protein doesn't want to start with the amino acid methionine, then there will be an enzyme that'll cut off methionine. Okay. So if the protein doesn't want the methionine, there will be a mechanism for removing that methionine. But initially, that protein will have methionine attached to it, and all proteins start with the amino acid methionine. All right, let's go down and talk a little bit about the genetic code. We mentioned that uh, uh, each nucleotide is not read as a group of one, there are three nucleotides read together to code for the amino acids. We call these codons. Uh, in humans, there are 20 different amino acids. And actually in most living things, there are about 20 different amino acids. If they have a different amino acid than a human, then they throw out an amino acid. So most living organisms have about 20 different amino acids. There are a few exceptions. I think the highest is something like there's a bacteria that contains 23 amino acids. You don't need to know that. The point is most living 
life forms contain 20 different amino acids, but there are slightly more than 60 codons possible. How this works out is, is that there is more than one codon for most of the amino acids. Uh, methionine is an exception. There's only one codon that codes for methionine. And we mentioned that also codes for start protein translation here. There's another one. You don't need to know this, but I think it's tryptophan. There's only one codon for tryptophan. It must be UGG. All of the other amino acids have two or more codons that code for the amino acid. Like phenylalanine, we have two codons that code for that amino acid. It's UUU and UUC. For some of them, there's four, like serine. Make sure I'm, nope, serine six, there's two down here. Um, proline, there we go. Proline, there's uh, four amino uh, codons that code for that amino acid. And then there's some, a few, where there's six codons that code for the amino acid, like leucine, the amino acid leucine. There's six. You don't need to know the specifics of that. I'm just trying to tell you that for most of the amino acids, there's more than one codon that codes for that amino acid. This is known as the redundancy of the genetic code, but there's more than one codon coding for most of the amino acids. And we mean redundant by the, that terminology, not to, the way redundancy is normally used. Any questions about any of that? Uh, not redundancy. Yeah, it is redundant, but it, we call it degenerate. So this is the degeneracy of the genetic code. And you can go look up degeneracy just means uh, in this sense that there's more than one possible codon for the amino acids. It doesn't mean that the DNA is a, a degenerate individual, which I mean a, a loathsome, despicable person. All right, any questions about protein translation? If not, let's watch a little video on protein translation. Translation is the synthesis of a protein from an mRNA template. This process involves several key molecules, including mRNA, the small and large subunits of the ribosome, tRNA, and finally, the release factor. The process is broken into three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. Let's see the process in action. Eukaryotic mRNA, the substrate for translation, has a unique three prime end called the poly A tail. mRNA also contains codons that will encode for specific amino acids. A methylated cap is found at the five prime end. Translation initiation begins when the small subunit of the ribosome attaches to the cap and moves to the translation initiation site. tRNA is another key molecule. It contains an anticodon that is complementary to the mRNA codon to which it binds. The first mRNA codon is typically AUG. Attached to the end of the tRNA is the corresponding amino acid. Methionine corresponds to the AUG codon. 
The large subunit of the ribosome now binds to create the peptidyl, or P-site, and the amino acyl, or A-site. The first tRNA occupies the P-site. The second tRNA enters the A-site and is complementary to the second mRNA codon. The methionine is then transferred to the A-site amino acid, the first tRNA exits, the ribosome moves along the mRNA, and the next tRNA enters. These are the basic steps of elongation. As elongation continues, the growing peptide is continually transferred to the A-site tRNA, the ribosome moves along the mRNA, and new tRNAs enter. When a stop codon is encountered in the A-site, a release factor enters the A-site and translation is terminated. When termination is reached, the ribosome dissociates and the newly formed protein is released. All right, any questions about any of that? So coming back here at the start, there's three really important molecules for protein translation. And I think they broke the uh, ribosome into two parts, but we'll just say the ribosome. <clears throat> and there are two parts to it because the messenger RNA actually um, is in between. So there's the ribosome, the messenger RNA, and the tRNA. Let's see if they got a picture of this. got it here. Let me break it down here. So the ribosomal units, the messenger RNA, and the tRNA. The tRNA, remember, recall, brings in the, the amino acid that uh, the tRNA has the anticodon region, which actually binds to the codon. And it's because of the anticodon that we say the tRNA does the actual reading of the messenger RNA. And the anticodon is the complementary basis of the codon. And then the amino acid is held on the other side of the tRNA. So ribosome, messenger RNA, and tRNA are the three main molecules. The ribosome moves down the messenger RNA and begins protein translation at the AUG site. The ribosome, we sometimes say, reads the messenger RNA because it does move down it, but it doesn't really read the messenger RNA. It's actually the tRNA that does. And the tRNA actually binds to, it's hydrogen bonding, to the codon, meaning the anticodon hydrogen bonds to the codon. The tRNA actually comes in a channel or hole in the ribosome to bind to the messenger RNA. And so the ribosome stabilizes it because it allows the tRNA to come in here and there's probably binding, hydrogen binding right here and here between the ribosome and the tRNA. And then there's hydrogen binding right here between the anticodon and the codon. Any question about any of that? So only the correct tRNA can come in and then bind to the codon, and then that brings in the correct amino acid. The first one will always be methionine. 
There's a second channel in the tRNA, or not the tRNA, the ribosome. In reality, there's a third channel, but the third channel isn't used. The second channel allows the second tRNA to come in, and it will have an anticodon, which will bind to the codon. Okay, any questions about any of that? In this case, uh, leucine is brought in. The next thing that happens is the amino acid, methionine, is removed from the tRNA, and that amino acid is covalently linked to the amino acid on the, what do you call it, the next tRNA site, which in this case would be the second uh, codon or the second amino acid, whatever you want to call it. Any questions about any of that? Remember when we discussed that there was an enzyme that was an RNA? Uh, this action right here, the removal of the amino acid from this tRNA, and then the linking of that amino acid to this amino acid, this is happening by an RNA enzyme or what is it, ribase? A ribozyme. A ribozyme, thank you. So this action right here is the only ribozyme that we'll talk about, meaning it's the RNA portion of the ribosome, which is doing this activity. Any questions about any of that? All right, when the uh, amino acid is removed from the tRNA, and in this case, it's the first amino acid removed from the first tRNA, that allows the tRNA to come out. And then that allows the ribosome to move down the messenger RNA. When the ribosome moves down the messenger RNA, what used to be the second codon in the second channel of the ribosome has now moved to the first channel of the ribosome. Any questions about any of that? That frees up the second channel of the ribosome for the second, or I should say the third uh, tRNA to come in, bringing in the third amino acid. When it is brought in, and of course that happens because of the uh, binding, binding between the anticodon and the codon, then the uh, amino acid linked to this tRNA is removed. And then this amino acid is linked to the newly added amino acid. And so we have the start of the pro growing protein chain, meaning the growing amino acid chain, that will eventually be the, the uh, protein bound right here. Any questions about any of that? Once again, when this amino acid is removed from this tRNA, this tRNA can then uh, fall off and leave the channel, which signals the ribosome to move down. And so the uh, this location will now be in the first channel, and then this location on the ribosome will be free to allow the next amino acid and tRNA to come in. The ribosome continues to move along the messenger RNA, adding new amino acids to the growing polypeptide chain. And, you know, they're just uh, 
the first one's here, the second one's here, the third amino acid's there, the fourth one there, and this is the newest amino acid. And that just goes on. Here we have an actual uh, AUG, which is adding methionine. And that just come, continues with the ribosome moving down the messenger RNA one codon at a time, allowing a new tRNA to come in, et cetera. And that continues. building up the polypeptide chain until we get the last amino acid, which is added, which is the now the protein, because the last amino acid has been added. And this happens when the ribosome reaches a stop codon. There's three different stop codons. And the stop codon tells the ribosome, stop protein translation here so that the rest of the messenger RNA is not translated because there's the stop codon. And the stop codon also uh, tells the uh, ribosome to come off of the messenger RNA that will free up the messenger RNA for other ribosomes to bind to it and the ribosome will disassociate, and that will release the uh, growing polypeptide chain, which is now fully made. So we're gonna call it the protein. And that's shown here, where the ribosome falls apart, releasing the new protein, and the uh, tRNA comes off the last one. Any questions about any of that? All right. If not, let's talk about a few complications. First, as this picture can show, this is showing you, it's actually showing you both protein um, transcription and protein translation. You can see on this portion here that this is one messenger RNA, it can have more than one ribosome binding to it. So this one has four ribosomes bound to this one messenger RNA, and the ribosomes are moving this way. So it's adding uh, amino acids, and that's why that chain is longer here than this one, than this one, than that one. And this we can see in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, where the messenger RNA can have more than one ribosome bound to it, in which case we will get more than one protein being made at the same time from this messenger RNA. So in this case, we have four different proteins being made. And let me see if I can find the protein. I think it's these reddish things, orangish things. These are the amino acids being added. Any question about that? So that's one complication. In bacteria, we have another complication. Oops, it's saying my internet connection is unstable. Can you guys hear me? Well, I'm gonna assume that you can still hear me. Uh, in bacteria, we have another complication and that is protein translation is happening in the cytoplasm. In bacteria, transcription is also happening in the cytoplasm. So here, we have a DNA molecule and it is being transcribed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe about eight times. If I counted that right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight times. So one messenger RNA, excuse me, one DNA gene can have more than one RNA polymerase bound to the gene, at least in bacteria. And 
you can have more than one messenger RNA being made at the same time. And in bacteria, this is transcription happening in the cytoplasm. So here is the string of uh, messenger RNA. The round stuff on the string of the, R of the RNA is actually proteins. So that we have transcription occurring at the same time protein translation is occurring. So this one was the first transcription that was made. So it's the longest messenger RNA. And you'll notice it has more of the round things and these molecules because there's more amino acids that have been added. And that's just a complication of things that happen in the bacteria because um, transcription is occurring in the same location as protein translation, meaning it's occurring in the cytoplasm. In eukaryotes, we always have transcription and translation being separated because transcription occurs in the nucleus and translation occurs in the cytoplasm. But you can have in eukaryotes more than one ribosome bound to the messenger RNA so that you'll get more than one protein being constructed at the same time. Any question about any of that? Now's your time to ask about the complication because now there's another complication I need to talk about. And this was briefly mentioned in one of the videos. And that is, there's special RNA processing happening in eukaryotes. The reason why this special processing of the, we'll say messenger RNA happens, is because in eukaryotes, when we transcribe a gene, we transcribe both the exons and the introns. The exons are the region of the gene that code for the protein in a messenger RNA. The introns do not code for the protein. So this initial RNA that is made by transcription like has to be, what? One hour? What's for food? What? Um, somebody, I think, has their microphone on. Um, that initial RNA molecule cannot leave the nucleus. There are pores here that will not allow a messenger RNA with introns in it to leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm. So what happens is the introns are spliced out, splice means cut, and then the exons are spliced together. In this case, we're using splice to be joined together, and the term is just spliced, okay? And so the initial RNA transcript is processed into the final messenger RNA that only contains the exons. Remember, exons code for the proton, protein, the amino acids of the protein. Introns do not. The introns have to be removed. And once they are removed, this messenger RNA can now leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm to be translated. Any questions about any of that? All right. You only see introns in eukaryotes that we're going to talk about. We're not going to talk about archaea, which I think have introns, uh, but bacteria do not have introns. So introns for us are only in eukaryotes. All right, so we've talked about the structure and function of the genetic material. Let's now move into the regulation of bacterial gene expression. The regulation of genes 
happens with operons. So one way to regulate the contents of a cell are to control gene expression. If the gene is not needed, the cell can turn that gene off. If the gene is needed, the cell can turn that gene on, assuming that it's turned off. There are some genes that are always turned on. We call them constitutive genes or an enzyme, which is a constitutive enzyme, meaning it's always turned on and it's expressed at a fixed rate. Those are sometimes called housekeeping genes. They're always on. There are other enzymes which are expressed only as needed. So they'll be turned on when they're needed. And they'll be turned off when they're not. You can have two ways to control turning on and off a gene. You have repressible genes and you have inducible genes. And that makes a, an enzyme. So you have repressible enzymes and inducible enzymes. There are other ways to control gene expression, such as by regulation, by pre-transcriptional control. And we're not gonna talk about it, but that's one way inducible operons work. There are also repressible operons. We're not gonna talk about that one. So you're not gonna be test on it. Uh, you will be tested on inducible operons. I should mention that. There's also epigenetic control, which is really hairy. So you're lucky we're not going to talk about it. You're not going to be tested on it. Uh, epigenetic way is uh, where the environment turns on a gene by epigenetic means. And then there's post-transcriptional control. We're not gonna talk about that one either. Uh, one post-transcriptional control means would be either to degrade the messenger RNA, and then you don't get uh, any uh, protein made, or you can inactivate the protein or degrade the protein. That's a post-transcriptional control. You're not, we're not gonna talk about that, and you're not gonna be tested on that. All right, here's a question for you. Does it make sense for a cell to make a protein product if the protein product is not needed? No. No, that would be a waste of energy if you were to make a protein product that the cell won't use. So it does make sense for genes to regulate their contents and then make the protein if it's needed and then shut the gene off if it is not needed. So how this happens, the regulation of gene expression, works because of operons. And an operon is a model of gene expression. An operon can be considered a super gene. So normally, when we're talking about a gene, oh, I got it shown here, all right. Normally, when we're talking about a gene, we're talking about a structural gene, like the enzyme lactase, or the gene that codes for blue eyes. So normally, when we're talking about a gene, we're talking about a structural gene. The nucleotides of the DNA, the code for that gene, okay? So that is a structural gene, which is a portion of the operon. But an operon is a super gene because it has controlling regions around the gene that control the expression of the structural gene. And we've already talked about one controlling region. We talked about a promoter, okay? And then there's another uh, 
controlling region we've talked about, and that follows the structural gene, and that would be the terminator, which isn't shown here, probably because the terminator is so small. And then an operator contains the structural genes, the controlling regions, and the terminator, which I think is a controlling region, but I'm, it's not shown here, so I'm not positive what you call the terminator. Anyways, that's what the operon contains. Now in eukaryotes, the operon is a little simpler because there's only one structural gene in each operon. In bacterial operons, we may have only one structural gene in the operon, but you may have related genes in the operon. We're going to talk about the LAC operon, which codes for the enzyme to degrade, uh, metabolize the sugar lactose. And the first gene here is the enzyme lactase. In the operon for the LAC operon, meaning for the lactose gene, uh, we actually have three structural genes. They are all related to the metabolism of the sugar lactose. The Z gene codes for the enzyme lactase. The Y gene codes for the channel protein that brings the sugar lactose across the cell membrane and then into the cell. The A gene helps in the metabolism of the sugar lactose. The A gene specifically is involved in converting. Uh, when you break down lactose, you get glucose and beta-galactose. The A gene is involved in converting beta-galactose into glucose. Any question about any of that? So in uh, bacteria, you can have more than one structural gene in the operon. If you have more than one, they are all related. And that's just the way bacterial operons are. The LAC operon is an inducible operon, which means it is normally turned off, but it can be turned on when the lactase gene is needed. Does that make sense? All right. So, Regulation of gene induction, uh, regulation of gene expression can happen by induction or repression. Inducible means that it's turned off and then when the gene is needed, it's turned on. Repression is the other way around where the gene is normally turned on, but it can be turned off. The LAC operon is an inducible gene. So it means that the gene is normally turned off. Why in E. coli would we normally have the lac operon turned off? What do you know about the sugar lactose? Okay, where do you find the sugar lactose? Nobody knows where you find the sugar lactose? You find lactose in dairy products. How common would it be for E. coli to be around um, how common would it be for E. coli to be around uh, the sugar lactose? Not very common. All right, are there any questions? If not, I'm gonna end it here.
And I'll see you at 6.30 if you have questions in the lab.